now that uh, that that evolves kind of over time, um, but even when I used to write on old legal pads, I like to move around a lot when I write. Um, I like to change um, my scenery, so I'll kind of always have like to go from kind of room to room, and I still do that. Um, my favorite place to write is actually in the um, in the back porch of my farmhouse that's screened in. And if the weather's okay, I'm back there with stacks of wood and there's trees out back. And I, I like that the best, but still I'll only work there for a little while and then I'll go in the house and then I'll go outside because for some reason just the moving around helps me um, think about the ideas and think about the last couple sentences I wrote. So I move around a lot. Well, I, like I say, I used to like to write longhand, even when I didn't have the opportunity. Uh, but, and even after I had the opportunity to write with a computer, I would still write longhand. But eventually, because I do so much editing, the computer just finally won out because it is so easy to change sentences and, and everything else and move paragraphs here and there. And I do so much of that. I go through so many drafts. And, and it used to be my old writing tablets were just almost illegible by the time I got through with arrows pointing here and things crossed out and then trying to include them again. And I think it's really the, the ease with which you can make the changes, not only that, but you can keep the old changes. I mean, you can set a file and then another file and another file and another file and another file, all of it under the same name. And so that you can go back and recapture um, a portion that you wrote once and you remember. I think that would actually work better than I thought it did when I released it. And so I do work on a computer. Well, generally, generally for me, that's a no-no. If there's something I'm using a lot, I'm using it too much. Um, and so I'll try to eliminate repetitions as much as I can unless I'm trying to oh, sort of like do something with a particular sound or, or um, and, and that's kind of a, you know, there's, there's kind of a, I don't know, you have to end up making decisions there because in speech people repeat words all the time and actually it's a comfort. Um, but in written language it, it, it's a red flag. And so you really have to kind of, so if you're trying to make people sound like people talk, you're going to be repetitious. But then when you put something down in print, you know, it shows up. Now, for example, in this last book that I wrote, one of the phrases that I repeated, because I hear it repeated so much, and it doesn't take up much room, is when, when somebody is corrected or meets somebody, you know, you'll say, um, oh, boy, it's really hot, and the other person will say, I know it. Um, and that phrase, it seems to be it seems to be uh, impossible to take that phrase out of at least the areas in which I've led, lived. It's like that. I know it, and it's it's like you know, and it even comes into you're an idiot. I know it, um, uh, or you're always thinking about this. I know it. Um, it's a way of deflecting criticism. It's a and it's also a, I don't know, it's just a very kind of human phrase that, uh, and I, so I'm contradicting myself, but I really do end up using that. I did purposely repeat that phrase um, a number of times in the book because I wanted my characters to be saying, I know it, I know it. I don't really have one. I mean, there's, there's kind of a group of them, and let's see, um, readers often, readers often want to know where the characters come from because you know they're trying to find kind of a connection to you and they and they want the characters to to have a little extra meaning for them and they they're trying to figure out how did you come up with this character and so I'll often hear about how do you how do you uh either get your ideas for characters or do you write about people that you know or um are your characters um pattern after real people um, so that's that's a very a very common one. Um, probably a little less common than where do you like to write? 
that uh, <laughs> that one that one comes up too. Or when do you like to write? For some reason, it's it's interesting to people. Do you like to write? Do you have a particular time you like to write, or uh, or you know time or places you like like to write? And again, that's another way of readers being able to familiarize yourself. They like to have a picture in their head um, for you know where you where you're doing that work that they've become familiar with. My stock answer for that is that I'm a very driven writer, which I am, but a writer with no discipline. So I don't have a regular schedule, and I'll write um, mostly in the afternoons, generally. And as I've gotten older, I've discovered that, unlike when I was younger, I, I could write, or thought I could write, for longer than six hours. I would write, you know, sometimes eight or ten hours in a day. But much of that writing after some point isn't productive and now I don't try to write after six, partly because I can't sleep if if you just concentrate. It's like having too much input on one thing. You just go your your mind circles and circles and circles and is very unproductive. So uh, about six hours, mostly in the afternoon, but that bleeds on into evening frequently. And, um, and but there are many days I, that I don't write any. I'm not a person that has ever been comfortable with imposing on me or the people that I usually live with is I have to work from this time to this time, so leave me alone. It, it just doesn't work that way and I, and I want my writing to be part of my sort of daily activity, to be part of the daily flow of the household so that uh, it's not taking a, a special place, it's just, so the writing fits in rather than people having to fit into my writing. So, which is part of the reason that my books take a long time. <laughs> You're always, I guess, or I am, what I try to do is tell a story. I mean, I'm basically a storyteller. And the story, in order to tell the story, the, there, there needs to be a place and there need to be characters and they need to be doing things. And those three elements of a story are always present. And the story that I'm trying to tell, um, for me always, or, or in order for it to really engage me enough to work, you know, five or ten years on, which these things usually take, is is I, I need to be, to feel some amount of urgency and passion in, in the theme. And so then the characters then are part of that theme and they, and, and by working with them I work out my thoughts on these particular things like, you know, like freedom or like identity. And, and that gives me the opportunity to look at these different um, things from a number of places and, and to come to a better understanding of them for myself. And I guess if the character has in some way exhausted those themes, and I can't think of another theme in which that they're, that they're that their characters would help to portray, then I'm done with them. Um, but if in fact they have, they're suitable for another theme or another story, then, then, they, then they're available to, to use again. But the, the selection of characters, selection of place are, are important because the place dictates who can be in the place. I mean, you don't want characters that, that the readers will think, what is he doing here, or what is she doing here? She doesn't seem like a person that would be in a place like that. And then the other one is once you have the characters and you have things for them to do, if you try to force them to do something that the character wouldn't normally do, then it's not going to feel right. You think, hey, she wouldn't do that. She wouldn't say that. She wouldn't act like that in that situation from what you've told about her earlier. And so the place dictates characters and the char characters dictate uh, what they'll do, and the, the story somehow has to be told within those confines. So that's how it works. I think for me, at least so far, um, the stories seem to rise up out of my experience with the places that I live. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't exactly say they rise out of the ground, but, but they they do have, they definitely have something to do with the place. I mean, especially rural areas, which I like to write about, um, they're, in order to understand like a community, 
I think we in, it's like getting to understand like a family, you know, the next door family. The one thing that, first thing you have to, to, to uh, just forget about is the idea that everybody that belongs to this family is all the same, because they're not. They're very, family members are very, very different, but they share something in common. And that's kind of the way I feel about uh, communities, is that there's a kind of a similar tension that, that the people in that area share. But that's very, also very tricky too because they don't respond, all people don't respond to the same tension in the same way. In other words, everybody that lives in rural Colorado isn't a rough and tumble individualist. They aren't. There are all kinds of other people there, but the terrain that they live in is responded to differently. And the, the kinds of uh, uh, pressures or the, the habitual living circumstances that are imposed by the weather and the type of work that's involved in that area will end up having a certain tension among the people there, including a kind of a historical tension. And for example, in rural areas, the rural areas like in Wisconsin and much of Iowa too, are areas that have a long history of actually being exploited in su to some extent. People will come in, take, you know, the more aggressive people will come in, take what's most valuable, and then they don't stay there, they leave. Um, and then the people that stay there, uh, you know, accumulate, the, and this happened definitely in Wisconsin. I mean, it, you know, for 400 years, there were people coming in, taking first the beavers and then taking the timber. Um, and, but n none of that stayed there. Um, and so, and there's still, there's still kind of, there's a brain drain in all of these areas where the brightest people are, ta you know, through the educational system are actually taken out of there and, and sent to centers where um, there are a lot of other and that people that are that are, have a lot of potential but you still have the area but that area of exploitation in a rural area has a certain tension you know that involved and that's why rural areas are partly the people are a little reticent they're a little you know they're a little standoffish at first um, about uh, who you are and what you're doing there um, and, cl and can be clannish for, the, you know, for that particular reason. But uh, so it would be, I think, foolish to think that the stories that a person comes up with living in a particular area, getting used to those kinds of tensions, didn't have something to do with those tensions themselves. And so that's how I guess in, in my way, in my experience at least, that uh, I don't think the things that I write about are uniquely my concerns or my worries, but I think they're worries that I've learned or I've validated through myself by, you know, when I have them, then you see, well, am I, am I unique? No, I'm not unique. The, the, these, these are shared by all kinds of people around me, and that's one of the things that, that uh, gives us the, well, it endorses us in a way to be able to write about them because you're, you know, you, you've been convinced that these are other people. This, is, this isn't just my story, this is our story. There's something, well, it's like if you work as a roofer, you notice roofs. Um, I mean, you can't drive by a place without thinking, they need a new roof on that house. Or boy, that's a, you got to do a job on there. But if you're a writer, it's like you, you almost need to be working on something. And so, and much, so much of your work is not consciously driven. I mean, in the sense you can't take responsibility for the ideas you, you come up with, basically, because they just, they come, and the only thing you can end up feeling good about is you can, when you receive the idea, you can go, hey, that's a good idea. That's, that's your part, is recognizing that's a good idea. I could write about that. But uh, it always amazes me that there's something seems to be inexhaustible in me that wants to keep writing. So I'll work for a long time on, on oh, I'll exhaust this theme. Nope. Um, there'll be another one that'll then crop up. You know, you could write about this and you could write about this and you could write about this. So um, invariably, um, what you always hope to do is I want to write a book that presents 
in an even-handed manner the human experience and you end up realizing I've written a postage stamp. I mean, it's just, it doesn't go anywhere. It, it's a tiny, tiny little insignificant drop of water and I was shooting for the ocean and you want to try it again. Maybe I can get it this time. Maybe I can find the right story and the right way to tell it and the right characters and the right setting and I can tell a story that everybody will relate to and everybody will recognize that's how I feel. Um, never happened, but it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the, uh, I suppose it's the equivalent of, uh, you know, King Midas never gets enough gold and a writer never stops writing. Um, you know, it, it's just like the job is never done. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, from the first word to the last, for me, for me. Um, and it's uh, writing for me allows me to examine my emotions and my passions and my thoughts and my fears. I deal a lot with my fears in a way that because life always seems like it's too fast. It comes at me too quickly. I don't have enough time to absorb it. I don't have enough time to prepare what I, what I say, how I respond to people. I'm not taking enough in. Um, I'm constantly realizing I said the wrong thing. I should have been kinder. I should have been more thoughtful. I should have understood this situation because, you know, I was there. Why didn't I see that this person's real agenda was this? I didn't understand it. And when I don't, and when that happens, and it happens frequently, it, it's, that doesn't happen in writing because you can go over it and over it and over it and over it and try and look at everything that comes from these different angles. And then you also, by having your character share in your emotions, you can understand, that's why I did that. I didn't understand that emotion. That had to do with an earlier experience that I had, and I was acting out of the influence of that earlier experience. So the process of writing allows me to become better acquainted with the things that obscure or get in the way of me having um, what I would say a more a fuller experience and I would call that a spiritual experience is that rather than a mindful experience or a feeling experience or a passionate experience I know all about feelings and passions and all of these things but the overall harmony of, of how these things work together and being able to see it from up here where yes that's the way humans work. That's, that's how life works. That's how, that's how life is made possible by having these, you know, being afraid one day and being courageous the next. I mean, if you were all one, th if you were all courageous or you were all fearful, you know, it, it, it just, the life would be less successful and communities would be less successful when those are traded characteristics off between different, between different characters at different times then you can start to see how your actions play into a larger picture and these, these, these bigger insights which can never be entirely articulated but they can be sensed through different kinds of art and different kinds of literature are, are I don't know, I call them spiritual um, and that's uh, and so it's a very it's a very big spirituality is a very big part of my writing as has a sense of thankfulness um, it's like giving back uh, um, that is also a part of what of what I do um, it's like our appreciation I guess maybe that's a better word is that you know I appreciate um, the opportunity to be able to show the kinds of wonder I find in the world and the kind of, uh, I don't know, joy that I experience by watching other people um, find, overcome the obstacles that they have in their lives. Trying to think of how to answer that in a term that, in a way that, that isn't too general to be meaningless. Um, because there are so many kinds of writers and 
the, for instance, I mean, the, 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 the motivation for writing can, can be different for lots of different kinds of writers. Um, and when you first asked the question, I was, my first instinct was to say, there's a writer must in some way be partly an entertainer. It's like an entertainer that doesn't want to stand up himself um, in front of a camera. Um, or an entertainer that isn't quick enough to respond uh, the way like comedians can in real time, but takes time to think of the right response over time and then put them down. Um, but in thinking back, I think there are some writers that probably wouldn't even fit that description. They're really not entertainers and they're not concerned with entertaining. Um, and then there are fiction writers and non-fiction writers, and that can be really different. Um, and so I guess I'm going to have to say a, a writer is an individual that writes.